Hello, this is Jennifer Griffiths, Managing Editor of Analytical Chemistry. Welcome to our September podcast. Micrototal analysis systems, or labs on a chip, are devices that integrate several steps of a process onto a single, very small device. These devices typically consist of a chip, often made of glass with fluid conduits, or so-called channels, formed by PDMS, an inert, non-toxic organosilicon polymer. Originally, these chips were used to do experiments at the microscale, that is, the dimensions of the features on the chip measured in the micrometer range. But more recently, researchers have been striving to include nanoscale elements of less than 100 nanometers in size. In our cover feature article in the September 1st issue of Analytical Chemistry, graduate student Michelle Kovarik and Professor Stephen Jacobson of Indiana University describe how these nanofluidic elements can be incorporated in lab-on-a-chip devices. In the article, they discuss issues and challenges in sample preparation, fluid handling, separation, and detection of analytes on these devices. Unfortunately, the authors were unavailable for an interview, but Jonathan Swedler, one of Analytical Chemistry's associate editors, has agreed to talk with me today about nanofluidics. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Jennifer. So maybe we can start, if you could tell me what the difference is between microfluidics and nanofluidics? Well, this may sound, I guess I'd say tongue-in-cheek, but I guess the biggest difference is size. Nanofluidics are smaller, and so you can change this question around, I guess, and say, you know, Why does that difference matter? If the devices are smaller, that means that you can put more of them on a chip or on a device, and so you get a higher density. Some fundamental physical properties happen faster, so fluid mixing is much faster on a small scale because diffusional mixing will happen faster. So this allows you to do things faster. And then the other aspect is that some of the physical properties actually change, and this is actually what a lot of the interest in this article was and what a lot of the article was talking about is what changes as you go from microfluidics to nanofluidics. That's really, I guess, the biggest area that people are trying to exploit is this idea of high density or fast reactions as well as taking advantages of things that do change. My next question is, what are the advantages of working in the nanoscale regime? I would start out by saying my favorite set of examples are selective transport. If you take a a biological cell, my favorite one is a neuron. It works because the ion channels inside the neuron selectively transport potassium or sodium, and, and this is how the electrical properties of the cell evolve. And that's all actually nanofluidics and nanoscale transport, all similar to what people are trying to engineer. And so in one aspect, what's fun about this article is it basically is saying chemists and engineers have finally advanced to the point where they can design and hopefully make items that are on the same scale and work like some biological, in this case, biological enzymes, biological ion transport channels. And so we're trying to take advantage of the same physical properties and other properties that you know cells, for example, have taken advantage of for a long time. And so the difference, I would say, is that we're trying now to engineer these. And so the article in Analytical Chemistry by Steve Jacobson talked a little bit about some of the advantages of using biological pores in nanofabricated devices, and and that's one way to do this, and the other is just to make devices that have the selective transport. Other advantages include the fact that you can do engineered gels rather than take, for example, molecules and let them polymerize and form a random array. On the nanoscale, if you can actually engineer these, you can actually make um, ordered arrays that may have different properties, different selectivity for separations. They may allow different forms of transport, different forms of mixing, and all these can be advantageous. So the real difference or the real advantage of the nanoscale is that it actually bridges engineering and chemistry to allow one to have a different set of properties that in many cases can be useful. So then what are some of the challenges of incorporating these nanofluidic elements onto the chip? Well, I guess the biggest challenge is that it's small, so it's hard to make. Obviously, from an engineering point of view, you can make something that's a millimeter very easily. You can make things that are in the micron scale, and that's been available for a long time, but making something that's 100 nanometers reproducibly is more challenging. And so there's a lot of engineering challenges. Another challenge is that if you have nanoscale elements, the volume of a pore that is, say, 100 nanometers in a few micron thick membrane may be only on the order of attoliters. And so fluid handling on the attoliter range doesn't work very well if you're trying to move an attoliter into or out of a device. And so one of the challenges is laboratory to microfluidic device and microfluidic to nanofluidic area. 
And so fluid handling and interfacing is a little bit of a challenge. And then probably the last major challenge, and it certainly was addressed well in this article, is detection. If you have a molecule of interest that's present at even a relatively high concentration, millimolar, and you have a nanofluidic element that has a volume of neatoliter, then you're only talking about a few molecules present. And so detection is very hard. And that's especially true because a lot of the detection schemes that people tend to use, like UV absorbance, don't have favorable scaling laws. So everybody's chemistry course used, you know, the SPEC-20, and they looked at absorbance, and that's path length dependent. And if the path length is only on the nanoscale, then there's not much of a change in absorbance, and it's very hard to make work. And so people tend to have to use, you know, the nanoscale devices use fluorescence and use electrochemistry. There's an attempt to make mass spectrometry work, but a lot of the common detectors aren't easy to adapt to the nanoscale. And so the challenges are really engineering and detection and interfacing. And what drives the need for this is that the advantages basically allow us to do selective separations, detection, concentration. And so it's this dynamic of trying to then incorporate a few nanofluidic elements into a microfluidic device that I think really is where we're at currently. I see. So once you have one of these chips, what are some of the applications that you could use it for? A lot of the applications discussed in this article were both proof of concept, showing, for example, the ability to concentrate proteins or other molecules in a a zone on a microfluidic channel. So you have a microfluidic element, a channel, and then you actually use a nanofluidic element to do the concentration for selective introduction or actually selective transport. So you can eliminate salts, sodium chloride, for example, before then doing mass spectrometry analysis for rapid mixing. And so those are some of the, the drivers and some of the advantages of the device. The problem is they're all individual unit operations. People haven't made too many devices that combine all of those that would take a sample from the lab or from an air, for example, or or liquid, and then selectively isolate, concentrate, separate, use the nanofluidic elements for what it's intended to do, and then eventually detect and give an answer. So right now, for most nanofluidic platforms, we're at the development stage. They're not complete lab-on-a-chip devices, but they're unit operations or small pieces that are being tested. There's starting to be exceptions to that, Obviously, single-molecule DNA sequencing uses a nanofluidic element, but again, those systems are the most well-developed, and they're not still commercial. They're coming close. And so there's a lot of potential applications. A lot of this is, is looking into the future. To learn more about nanofluidic devices, we invite you to read the feature article appearing in our September 1st issue. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you.